church that you'd like to share or lift up today? Joys and concerns. We're very quiet today. I, I would like to just say Happy Mother's Day to all of those ladies that are out there that have impacted my children that, you know, from aunts to teachers to cafeteria workers to bus drivers to just so many women have impacted my child's life in so many ways and they may have been a mother and they may not, but they sure have been appreciated um, by me. And happy Mother's Day to all those ladies as well. Amen. Thank you. Any other joys and concerns to share today? I had a joy again. I had my daughter Leslie and my granddaughter Allison and her fiance Gus visiting today. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Anyone else? Joys and concerns? We have it. We just wanted to thank everyone for the graduation cards. It was like, I wanted to thank everyone for the graduation cards. It was such a blessing. Anyone else? Joys and concerns? Then please join with me now in our call to worship that is printed in the bulletin. Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand with sinners or join in with mockers. They are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Let us pray. Lord God, to meditate upon your law is to learn of your love and know of your righteousness. Lord, we know you are a God of tender mercy whose benevolent care protects our children, protects all of creation. And so we gather today to worship you as creatures of your body, the church, made whole by the redeeming love of Jesus. Open our hearts to sing of your goodness, our minds to explore your word, and our lips to give you all praise. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand now and join our first hymn, 276. <laughs>
first together and then in silence. Please join with me. Merciful God, though you call us to delight in your teachings, we can become cynical and full of doubt. We pray that you would heal us and restore us to you. Guard and protect us from evil and sanctify us in the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Brothers and sisters, hear this good news. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And so I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And may the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us unto eternal life. Amen. testimony, but surely divine testimony is stronger. And this threefold testimony is indeed that of God himself, the witness he has borne to his son. He who believes in the son of God has this testimony in his own heart, but he who disbelieves God makes him out to be a liar by refusing to accept God's own witness to his son. The witness is this, that God has given us eternal life and that this life is found in his Son. He who possesses the Son has life indeed. He who does not possess the Son of God has not that life. And the second reading is John chapter 17, starting with verse 6. I have made thy name known to those whom thou didst give me out of the world. They were thine, thou gavest them to me, and they have obeyed thy command. Now they know that all thy gifts have come to me from thee. For I have taught them all that I learned from thee, and they have received it. They know with certainty that I came from thee. They have had faith to believe that thou didst send me. I pray for them. 
I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me, because they belong to thee. All that is mine is thine, and what is thine is mine, and through them has my glory shown. I am to stay no longer in the world, but they are still in the world, and I am on my way to thee. Holy Father, protect by the power of thy name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one, as we are one. When I was with them, I protected by the power of thy name those whom thou hast given me, and kept them safe. Not one of them is lost except the man who must be lost, for scripture has to be fulfilled. And now I am coming to thee, but while I am still in the world, I speak these words so that they may have my joy within them in full measure. I have delivered thy word to them, and the world hates them because they are strangers in the world, as I am. I pray thee not to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are strangers in the world, as I am. Consecrate them by the truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I now consecrate myself, that they too may be consecrated by the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. For the past few weeks um, since I've arrived, you know, in this Easter season of celebration in the church calendar, we've been exposed to the writings of John the beloved disciple. And we've heard what he's testified concerning the word of life, he says, the light of the world that has now come to enlighten our darkness. He who is the truth, the way, life itself, Jesus. And you know, what we just heard read, both from John, you can see John has a tendency to portray things in stark, fundamental terms. Either people are far or against Jesus, far or against the light, the truth. There's no halfway, no lukewarm, still deciding sort of option in John's understanding of how we live our lives. And so, you know, that can sound rather harsh um, at times to us, unreasonable maybe. Why should we not be able to reserve our judgment for a little while? In most areas of our lives, making a hasty decision, right? Without being sure we've fully come to terms with all the necessary information, that's foolish, right? It's sometimes dangerous. And all the more so when the decisions involve committing ourselves to something or someone for life. So we want to see you know, those kind of commitments made on the basis of extended, sober reflection. And prayer. So, you know, when you read John, why is John dividing us all up into those who are for and against without allowing us some time in the undecided category? Those who believe in the Son of God have God's testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe have made God out to be a liar. I think I always have to qualify too, because this one's hard, y'all. Is that I'm preaching to myself as well. I got preached this all week, so remember that. I think to understand where John is coming from here, we you know, we first need to understand where he's coming, where he's coming, the urgency he feels. The urgency he feels for all the world's history and purpose funnels down upon this testimony which he proclaims. It's the meaning of all of creation itself. And with its fulfillment, the end of the world is here in Jesus. The end of the ages is here in Jesus. And so as the church has waited these 2,000 years for Christ's return, how do we get, right? We kind of get, well, he's not coming back. We kind of just sit in our seat, right? We don't, we don't have that same sense of urgency. He might come this afternoon. Let him come, praise the Lord, come Lord Jesus. But we've lost that, right? 
over these 2,000 years. We've lost that same sense of urgency and finality um, that it should still bring in how we understand our lives in this present moment. And I think we also need to realize that when John speaks of believing, he's not asking us to evaluate and decide on a philosophy or a set of ideas as the world would have us to do. He's not saying, here, I want you to read the fine print quickly and give me a signature on the line at the bottom before I take my foot out the door. You know, there's no fine print. There's no argument to be gone over in minutia before a decision can be made. As Paul says, today is the day of salvation. So John is not talking about our response to a doctrinal position. He's not ta he's talking about our response to a person, right? Our belief in a person, Jesus the Christ. So again, in the thinking of John, the final judgment of every individual, we were talking about that in Sunday school this morning, and the final judgment of the world itself takes place in their response to Jesus to his words and actions and the way he goes about his life and ministry. And so just saying that I believe in Jesus has a tendency to leave out whole huge sections of what that means and how it ultimately impacts our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, I grew up hearing that phrase. I didn't grow up Presbyterian. Um, I heard that in the church all the time when I was younger. I believe in Jesus. But I came to realize it meant different things to different people. And not necessarily what the writers of the scriptures were alluding to. And that's what I've been called to do, right? Is to preach this scripture, this gospel. And so maybe it would be easier to understand that distinction if we think about what it would mean if we use this language in reference to someone other than Jesus. For instance, if we were to talk about whether you believe in the president, we wouldn't be talking about whether you accept in principle certain theories about him, about the nature of his office, not for most of us, I don't think. You know, we don't, we're not thinking about policies. It's much more emotional and visceral, isn't it? We will be asking whether you trust Joe Biden, whether you have faith in him. We would be asking whether when you encounter this man and see the way he operates and exercises his office, whether you perceive yourself to be in the presence of virtue and truth and integrity, whether he inspires your allegiance, makes you want to get on his side and back him all the way. So let's ask it again with other examples too. Do you believe in Donald Trump? Do you believe in Bernie Sanders? Do you believe in the Dalai Lama? Do you believe in Katy Perry? Do you believe in Justin Bieber? Do you believe in Taylor Swift? <laughs> Even while I, with my glasses on, I can still see some of your facial reactions. <laughs> As I ask those questions, do you notice how each one of you individually, inside, you have a gut reaction? To each of them. Even though we don't really know them. In most cases, you could have answered yes or no without having to think so much about it, right? And maybe you have in your head. So you see, it's not about complex theories or careful weighing of the evidence, even if it could be, even if it should be, in many ways, in God's love. Based on however much or little we know, about them, they each stand for certain things in our mind. And those who seem to represent things we value thereby evoke a positive response in us. We believe in them. We trust them. We wish that we and others around us could become more like them and embody the values and characteristics we associate with them. So, now listen again. Do you believe in Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, the Son of God? Do you see the point of the question? So again, John is not asking you what doctrines you necessarily believe about Jesus, although that's important 
in the church, in the world. He's asking whether when you realize who Jesus is and what he stands for, you want to devote yourself to him. You want to back Jesus all the way. You want to give Jesus your all. You want to leave everything else behind and put him and his will first. Or whether maybe you find yourself saying, I don't want to grow into that, so go away. Leave me alone. John makes clear that when we respond to Jesus for or against, the stakes are a lot higher, of course, than when we make our response to Joe or Donald. When we respond to Jesus for or against, we are responding for or against God. Believe in the Son and you're accepting what God says. Do not believe in the Son and you're calling God a liar. John says. And he reports Jesus as saying that he has personally made God's name known to us. In other words, we didn't really know who God was. We don't know who God is until Jesus lets us in on who God really is. And what God is really like. And when we respond to Jesus for or against, we're responding for or against life itself. For John says that true life is in God's Son. And those who accept the Son have life. And those who reject the Son reject life in His Spirit. Membership in His body, the church, where that Spirit is poured out. So maybe John's all or nothing attitude begins to make a little more sense from where he's coming from. When we encounter Jesus on the pathway of life, we're encountering the truth about God and the truth about life as it was created to be lived. Because he is the first fruits, right, of that new creation of what God had intended from the beginning. That's Jesus. We're seeing the truth about what we were created to be, what we're destined to become in Jesus. And you really can't delay responding to that if you want to. Again, Paul says today is the day of salvation. It is in your hearing right now. And those responses will stir in your guts as instantly and unavoidably as did your responses to those various names a few moments back. Each time you're granted by the Holy Spirit and insight into who Jesus is and what he was displaying in his life and ministry. You find yourself responding inside, right? Internally, yes, I trust him. Or I will follow him. Or no, I don't believe it's necessarily the truth about God that Jesus is speaking. And John says Jesus pulled no punches. We sort of talked about that in Sunday school this morning, a little bit. You know, Jesus said he came to cast fire on this earth. To shake it up, to bring it back to what it's supposed to be. And Paul follows suit. But John says Jesus pulled no punches about the cost of siding with him. And you heard it in the scripture I just read. That's how all early Christians understood their following of Jesus. I'd recommend The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He talks about this as well. Say yes to Jesus and you'll no longer fit comfortably in this fallen world. And in many ways, this world will turn against you. Now, you know, that of course sounds like, how that's just overblown rhetoric. And you know it does to most of us now. It's different from the early church, but things have changed. And, you know, the world doesn't hate us as the church, but it regards us as a harmless irrelevance most of the time. It ignores us. But that's not because Jesus was overstating the case, but because we have so understated our witness to Jesus. And many times we meekly surrender to society's demand that we give up our expectations 
of a transforming fire on this earth by the Holy Spirit and just go over there and occupy our socially prescribed roles, right? Of being chaplain to society. So no wonder most people around us don't have any strong reaction to Jesus for or against. He seems irrelevant to their lives nowadays. But maybe they've not been given the opportunity to truly see him, to truly meet him. But have instead been offered a hollowed out, toned down Jesus. Like all you got to do is read this gospel, right? Jesus is in your face. He's not some domesticated buddy Jesus, an innocuous kind of figure who wouldn't inspire or rightly overall anybody, right? People followed him because of who he was, but they also left him because of who he was. And so we gathered here in his name, in his name, can't avoid some of the blame for people not really meeting him because we are the body of Christ. We are the ones who have committed ourselves publicly to following Him. Following Him. And being His sacramental body. His living presence in and to the world. And I'm guilty of this too. So hear me when I'm saying this. I'm including myself. Many times we preach a tamed gospel. We live out a flaccid discipleship. And instead we covet a cozy friendship with the world. Do those words describe us? You know, only each one of us know the answer by spending one-on-one -on -one time with God and allowing Him to help us look deep inside our own hearts. But as always with God, underneath it all, this all comes from what? We said this in Sunday school too. Love. Love. God loves all and wants all to turn back to Him. To be in right relationship with Him. And so the good news is Christ is bigger than all of us. And He won't be confined to our negligible efforts to embody His truth, but will pour out His Spirit if we ask will pour out His Spirit on faithful people who will take that light that's been handed to them and not hide it under a bushel, but show it to the world who Jesus is. And so we're, we right here at Oxford are part of that, right? We're called by His name. Wherever we go out in that world to show forth His glory, as He said in that scripture, those that are His, they let my name, the glory of it, shine for them. And Jesus himself said in that scripture that he prays for us. Think about that. He prays for each one of us right now. And so we can yet be caught up in that new winds of the Holy Spirit that blow and say yes to the fullness of life and love for which we were created, to which we're destined to in Christ. And so I ask all of us, in conclusion, including myself, Kyle, do you believe in Jesus? Do you stand with Him? Will you give Him your all? Amen. If you'll please stand with me now and join in our affirmation of faith from the Nicene Creed. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, 
was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Please be seated now. I turn to hymn number 522. truly be the first fruits of your kingdom in this world. Lord, we pray for the people of the world. We pray for the leaders of this world. That they might be sanctified in your truth. That they might hear your voice and thus live out your peace on this earth. We ask that you would direct those who make, administer, judge our laws here in America. We pray for the president. We pray for our governor, others in authority among us, Lord, that they would be guided by your wisdom. That they might lead us in the way of righteousness, which is your path. Lord God, we also give thanks that you are merciful and a healer, and we know that you bear the pain of this world. And so we ask that you look with compassion on those who are sick, are suffering, and we especially lift up those named on our prayer list, those who are on our minds and hearts. Lord, please cheer them by your word. Bring them healing as a sign of your grace. 
And Lord, we ask that you would stand with those who sorrow, who grieve, that they can be sure that neither death nor life nor things present nor things to come shall separate them from your love. And Lord, as Beverly said earlier on this glorious Mother's Day, we think of all mothers, but also all women. And we just celebrate all families, Lord, the gift of family. We see your glory, your wisdom, and the diversity of that gift. And we pray for all small families like Elizabeth and Zachariah and their precious only son, John. And for large families like Jacob's with his 12 sons. We ask your blessing on multi-generational families like Timothy's whose mother and grandmother raised him in the faith. We ask you to bless single person families like Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. We pray for broken families like King David's. And for those like Ruth and Naomi who came through the pain of loss to establish new family ties. Lord, we know that you love all families, so help us to support them in all their shapes and situations. And Lord, we need your love poured out into our hearts so that we can love each other in that same way. Lord, make us grateful for our parents. Remind us that we always have you and this covenant family, this home away from home, this church. For you're like a mother who will not abandon the child in her arms like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home. And so Lord, again, we give thanks for mothers the world over all those who have nurtured and cared for us, birth mothers, adoptive mothers, surrogate mothers, aunts, grandmothers, teachers, neighbors, all those women who have shared their faith with us and strengthened us on the way. And Lord, we remember Jesus saying that whoever does the will of God is his mother and his brother and his sister. Lord, help us to be your children, your family, in all the ways you've imagined for us. And we love you, Lord. Guide us, protect us, challenge us to follow your will. And we close by saying the prayer Jesus taught us to pray as his family, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us continue to worship the Lord by giving of our tithes and offerings.
Jesus has made God known to us. We already belong to God. And so we dedicate these gifts to God's service and to the glory of God's name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our final hymn is 389. make you holy in every way and keep your whole being spirit soul and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ amen Wow. <laughs> 